Eventually, these punishments became so severe that the crime was made to fit them. Certainly since the First Crusade, there has been profound guilt on the part of non-Jews, particularly on the part of the Gentile Church. Because at the time of the First Crusade, you had the massacre of all Jews and incidentally Muslims in Jerusalem. Um, as soon as the Crusaders managed to uh, breach the walls in 1099, on the way you have tens of thousands of Jews massacred in the most brutal fashion by the crusading armies. And it's not a coincidence, I believe, that within just over a generation of those terrible massacres of Jews by Christian Gentiles, for the first time such massacres, you have developed the myth that Jews massacre Christian children and use their blood for making the unleavened bread for Passover. The legend of ritual murder was rejected by some popes, embraced by others. Here in the Austrian Tyrol, a Catholic church still displays the remains of a child, Anderl of Rin, canonized in 1755 by a papal bull. It claims the child was killed by Jews in a Passover ritual. There was a Jewish sect who drank children's blood. A Jewish sect. It's a fact. Christians who believed these superstitions worked hard to sever Jesus from his Jewish roots. It's a little uh, more difficult to de-Judaize Christ than it is to de-Judaize his mother, Mary. The whole tradition in the Middle Ages is to try to sort of rip her out of her, her Jewish background. Mary is a Christian almost from the word go. Uh, it's, very, it's very interesting if you read plays and stories of the Middle Ages, you could hardly identify Mary as a Jew. Christ is a little more difficult because of his relationship to the prophets and all of the prophecies in the Hebrew Bible supposedly pointing toward Jesus. And there are standard stereotypical depictions of Jews in the Middle Ages, and Christ doesn't look like those, that's for sure. He doesn't have uh, other features as well. He's not wearing typical Jewish costumes like a pointed hat or something of that sort. Jesus was separated from Judaism, and Jews were forbidden to practice most trades, excluded from guilds and forbidden to own land. But they were allowed to lend money. The consequences would be profound. The image of usury, the image of a person charging exorbitant interest, is really quite an arresting image on cathedrals and in other media. I may not be uh, voicing the general opinion here. I think it is the most potent stereotype, the most potent. I think that it's particularly potent because every day in medieval Europe, hundreds or even thousands of times, people went to Jews to pawn very precious objects to them. And what we have to think about as historians uh, or modern day people is what that relationship meant. It's not simply, by the way, a question of humiliation by an other who is supposedly, who should be lower in the social hierarchy. We have to imagine people going to the Jew, and very frequently, by the way, it's women, uh, Christian women, going to Jewish women to, to borrow money, and pawning things like wedding rings or jewelry, things that are very precious. I mean, they may not be intrinsically valuable, but very precious to them. And we have to imagine a situation in which they don't really get very much for what they're pawning. I mean, if we, if we use our historical imagination that way, then we see a person walking away from that relationship, a Christian walking away from that relationship, in which the only thing he or she can say is, is damn it, you know, I, why did I have to do this? Why did I have to give it up? Why did I have to borrow money from a Jew? Why didn't she or he give me more money for, for this piece of bedding that I, that I pawned? Why am I in this relationship? And to my, from my point of view, that is the sort of thing that's, that's transferred to children. That's the sort of thing that makes it possible 